Dracula by Bram Stoker Read by Greg Haynes Chapter 1 Jonathan Harker's Journal Kept in Shorthand 3rd May Bistrus Left Munich at 8.35 p.m. on 1st May, arriving in Vienna early next morning. Should have arrived at 6.46, but train was an hour late. Budapest seems a wonderful place, from the glimpse I, from which I got from the train, and the little I could walk through the streets. I feared to go very far from the station, as we had arrived late and would start as near the correct time as possible. The impression that I had was that we were leaving the west and entering the east, the most western of splendid bridges over the Danube, which is here of noble width and depth, took us amongst the traditions of Turkish rule. We left in a pretty good time, and came after nightfall to Klausenberg. Here I stopped for the night at the Hotel Royale. I had for dinner, or rather supper, a chicken done up with, in some way with red pepper, which was very good, but very thirsty. Memo. Get recipe for Mina. I asked the waiter, and he said it was called Paprika Hindel, and that, as it was the national dish, I should be able to get it anywhere along the Carpathians. I found my smattering of German, German very useful here. Indeed, I don't know how I should be able to get on without it. Having had some time at my disposal when I was in London, I visited the British Museum and made search among the books and maps in the library regarding Transylvania. It had struck me that some foreknowledge of the country would hardly fail to have some importance in dealing with a nobleman of that country. I find that the distinct that the district he named is in the extreme east of the country, just on the border of three individual states, Transylvania, Moldavia, and Bukovina, in the midst of the Carpathian Mountains, one of the wildest and least known portions of Europe. I was not able to light on any map or work given the exact locality of the Castle Dracula, as there are no maps of this country as of yet to compare with our own ordnance survey maps. But they found Bistrist, the port, the post town named by Count Dracula, is a fairly well-known place. I shall enter here some of my notes, as they may refresh my memory when I talk over my travels with Mina. The population of Transylvania, there are in four distinct nationalities, the Saxons in the south, and mixed with them the Wallaches, which, who, who are descendants of the Dracines, the Magyars in the west, and the Skileos of the east and north. I am going among the latter, who claim to be descended from Attila and the Huns. This may be so, for when the Magyars conquered the country in the 11th century, they had already found the Huns had settled in it. I read that every known superstition in the world is gathered into this horseshoe of the Carpathians, as if it were the center of some imaginative whirlpool. If so, then my stay may be very interesting. Memo. I must ask the Count about all about them. I did not sleep very well, though my bed was comfortable enough, for I had all sorts of queer dreams. There was a dog howling all night under my window, which may have had something to do with it, or it may have been the paprika, for I had drunk all the water in my cafe and was still very thirsty. Towards the morning I slept and was wakened by the continuous knocking at my door, so I guessed I must have been sleeping soundly then. I had for breakfast more paprika, and a sort of porridge of maize flour, which they s said was mamalinga, an eggplant stuffed with force meat, a very excellent dish, which they called impeltata. Mem, get the recipe for this also. I had to hurry, for, hurry breakfast, for the train started a little before eight, or rather it ought to have done so, for having, after rushed to the station at 7.30, I had to sit in the carriage for more than an hour before we began to move. It seems that the further east you go, the more unpunctual the trains are. <laughs> I wonder what they be in China. All day long we seemed to dawdle through a country that was full of beauty of every kind. Sometimes we saw little towns or castles on the top of steep hills, such as we see in old missiles. Sometimes we ran by rivers and streams, which seemed to, from the wide stony margin on each side of them, to be the subject of great floods. It takes a lot of water, and running strong, 
to sweep the outside edge of, the, of a river clear. At every station there were groups of people, sometimes crowds, and in all sorts of attire. Some of them were just like the peasants at home, or those I saw coming through France and Germany, with short jackets and round hats and homemade trousers, but others were very picturesque. The women looked pretty, except when you got near them, but they were very clumsy about the waist. They had all full white sleeves of some kind or another, and most of them had big belts with lots of strips of something fluttering from them like the dresses in a ballet. But of course, there were petticoats under them. The strangest figures I saw were the Slovaks, who were more barbarian than the rest, with their big cowboy hats, great baggy dirty white trousers, white linen shirts, and enormous heavy leather belts, nearly a foot wide, all studded with, over with brass nails. They wore high boots with their trousers tucked into them, and had, had long black hair and heavy moustaches. They were very picturesque, but, did not, but do not look prepossessing. On the stage, they would be set down at once as some old oriental bands of brigands. They are, however, I am told, very harmless and wanting in natural self-assertion. It was on the dark side of twilight when we got to Bistrus, where, which is a very interesting old place, being practically on the frontier, for the Borgo Pass leads from it into Bocovina itself. It had a very stormy existence, and certainly shows marks of it. Fifty years ago, a series of great fires took place, which made terrible havoc on five separate occasions. At the beginning of the 17th century, it underwent a siege of three weeks and lost 13,000 people, the casualties of war proper being assist, properly assisted by famine and disease. Count Dracula directed me to go to the Golden Crone Hotel, which I found to my great delight to be thoroughly old-fashioned, for of course I wanted to see all that I could in the ways of the country. I had evidently expected... I was evidently expected, for when I got near the door, I was faced with a cheery-looking elderly woman in the usual peasant dress, white undergarments with a double apron, front and back, of off-colored stiff fitting, almost too tightly for modesty. When I came close, she bowed and said, The Herr Englishman? Yes, I said. Jonathan Harker. She smiled and gave some message to an elderly man in, white, in a white sleeveless shirt sleeves, who had followed her to the door. He went, but immediately returned with a letter. <clears throat> My friend, welcome to the Carpathians. I am anxiously expecting you. Sleep well tonight. At three tomorrow, the diligence will start for Bokulvina. A place on it is kept for you. At the Borgo Pass, my carriage will await you and bring you to me. I trust that your journey from London has been a happy one, and that you will enjoy your stay in my beautiful land. Your friend, Dracula. 4th May I found that my landlord had gotten a letter from the Count, directing him to secure the best place on the coach for me. But on making inquiries as to the details, he seemed somewhat retracient, and pretended that he could not understand my German. This could not be true, because up until then he understood it perfectly. At least he answered my questions exactly as if he did. He and his wife, the old lady who received me, looked at each other in a frightened sort of way. He mumbled out that the money had been sent in a letter, and that that's all, that was all that he knew. When I asked him if he knew Count Dracula, and could tell me anything about his capsule, both he and his wife crossed themselves, and saying that they knew nothing at all, simply refusing to speak further. It was so near the time of, st of starting that I had no time to ask anyone else, for it was all very mysterious, and not by any means comforting. Just before I was leaving, the old lady came up to my room and said in a very hysterical way, Must you go? Oh, young hair, must you go? She was in such an excited state that she seemed to have lost her grip on what little German she knew and mixed it up with some other language which I did not know at all. I was, about, I was able to just be able to follow her by asking many questions. When I told her that I must go at once and that I was engaged in important business, she asked again, do you know what today is? I asked. I answered that it was the 4th of May. 
She shook her head again and said again, Oh, yes, I know, I know that. I, I know that. But do you know what to the day is? On my saying, I do not understand, she went on. It is the eve of St. George's Day. Do you not know that tonight, when the clock strikes midnight, all the evil things in the world will have full sway? Do you know where you are going and what you are going to? She was in such evident distress that I tried to comfort her, but without any effect. Finally, she went down on her knees and implored me not to go. At least wait a day or two before starting. It was all very ridiculous, but I did not feel comfortable. However, there was business to be done, and I could not allow nothing to interfere with it. I therefore tried to raise her up and said as gravely as I could that I thanked her, but my duty was imperative, that I must go. She then rose and dried her eyes, and taking a crucifix from around her neck, she offered it to me. I did not know what to do, for, as an English churchman, I had been taught to regard such things as measures of idolatrousness, and yet it seemed so ungracious of me to refuse an old lady so well and in such a state of mind. She saw, I suppose, the doubt in my face, for, as she, for she put the rosary around my neck and said, For your mother's sake, and went out of the room. I am writing this part of the diary whilst I am waiting for the coach, which is, of course, late, and the crucifix is still around my neck. Whether it is the old lady's fear, or the many ghostly traditions of the place, or the crucifix itself, I do not know, but I am not feeling nearly as easy of mind as usual. If this book should reach Mina before I do, let it bring my goodbye. Here comes the coach! 5th May. The Castle. The grey of the morning had passed, and the sun is high over the distant horizon, which seems jaggy, whether by with trees or hills I know not, for it is so far off that big things and little things are mixed. I am not sleepy, and as I am not to be called until I am awake, naturally I write till sleep comes. There are many odd things to put down, and lest who reads this may fancy I dined too well before I left Bisterus, let me put down exactly what I had for dinner. I dined on what they called robber steak, bits of bacon, onion, and beef seasoned with red pepper, and strung on sticks and roasted on the fire, in the simple style of the London cat's meat. The wine was golden med medius, which is, produces a queer sting to the tongue, which is, however not, however, not disagreeable. I only had a couple of glasses of this and nothing else. When I got on the coach and the driver... When I got on the coach, the driver had not taken his seat, but I, and I saw him talking to the landlady. They were evidently talking out of me, for every now and then they would look at me, and some of the people who were sitting on the bench outside the door, which they called by a name meaning word-bearer, came and listened, and then looked at me, most of them pityingly. I could hear a lot of them, uh, I could hear a lot of words often repeated, queer words, for there were many nationalities in the crowd. So I quietly got my polygot dictionary from my bag and looked at them and looked them out. I must say they were not cheering to me, for amongst them there were Orgdog, Satan, Pokoi, Hell, Schoenkosia, Witch, Vorlok, and Vokostak, both of which mean the same thing, one being Solvak and the other Servian for something that is either werewolf or vampire. Mem, I must ask the count about these superstitions. When we started, the crowd round the inn door, which had by this time swelled to a considerable size, made the sign of the cross and pointed two fingers towards me. With some difficulty, I got a fellow passenger to tell me what they meant. He would not answer at first, but upon learning that I was English, he explained that it was a charm or guard against the evil eye. This was not, a very, ple this was not very pleasing to me just starting for an unknown place to meet an unknown man. But every one seemed so kind-hearted and so sorrowful and so sympathetic that I could not but be touched. I shall never forget the last glimpse I had of the inn-yard and the crowds of picturesque figures all crossing themselves as they stood around the wide archway with its background of rich foliage of oleander and orange trees in green tubs clustered in the center of the yard. Then our driver, whose wide-latent drawers covered the whole front of the box seat, uh, Gotsa, they called them, 
cracked the big whip over his four small horses, which ran abreast, and set off on our journey. I soon lost sight and recollection of ghostly fears and the beauty of the scene as we drove along, although, had I known the language, or rather languages, which my fellow passengers were speaking, I might not have been able to throw them off so easily. Before us laid green, a green sloping land full of forests and woods, here and there sloping hills, crowned with clumps of trees or with farmhouses, the blank gabe ended on the road. There was everywhere a bewildering mass of fruit blossom, apple, plum, pear, cherry, and as we drove by I could see the green grass under the trees sprawled with falling petals. In and out amongst these green hills of what they called here the Meta Land ran the road losing itself as it swept round the grassy curve or was shut out by the straggling ends of pine woods which here and there ran down the hillsides like tongues of flame. The road was rugged but we seemed to fly over it with a feverish haste. I could not understand then what the haste meant, but the driver was evidently bent on losing no time in reaching the Borgo Prude. I was told that this road in the summertime is excellent, but it had not yet been put in order after the winter snows. In this respect, it is different from the general run of roads in the Carpathians, for it is an old tradition that they are not kept be kept in too good of order of the old hospitors who will not repair them lest the Turks should think they were preparing to bring in foreign forces, so and so hastened the war which was already at, always really at a lodging point. Beyond the green hills swell the right beyond the green swelling hills of the Mitaland rose mighty slopes of forest up to the lofty steps of the Carpathians themselves. Right and left of us they towered, with the afternoon sun falling full upon them and bringing all the glorious colors of this beautiful range, deep blue and purple in the shadows of the peaks, green and brown with grass and rock mingled, and an endless perspective of jagged rock and pointed crags until they, they, they were themselves lost in the distance, where the snowy peaks rose grandly. Here and there seemed mighty rifts in the mountain, though which, as the sun began to sink, we saw now and again the white gleam of falling water. One of my companions touched my arm as we swept round the base of a hill and opened up, opened up the lofty snow-covered peak of a mountain, which seemed, as we wound uh, on our serpentine way, to be right before us. Look, Easton Zek, God seek! And he crossed himself reverently. As we round our endless way and the sun, sun sank lower and lower behind us, the shadows of the evening began to crep round us. This was emphasized by the fact that the snowy mountain top still held the sunset and seemed to glow with, to glow out with a delicate cool pink. Here and there we passed the Czechs and the Slavaks, all in picturesque attire, but I noticed the Gotter were painfully prevalent. By the roadside were many crosses, and as we swept by, my companions crossed themselves. Here and there were a, was a peasant man or woman kneeling before a shrine who did not even turn around as we approached, but seemed in the self-surrender of devotion to have neither ears nor eyes of the world outside. There were many things new to me. For instance, hayricks in the trees, and here and there very beautiful masses of weeping birch, their white stems shining like silver through the delicate green of leaves. Now and again we passed a litter wagon, the ordinary peasant's cart, with its long snake-like vertebra, calculated to suit the inequalities of the road. On this were sure to be seated a group of, of homecoming peasants, the Czechs with their, with their white, and the Slovaks with their colored sheepskins, the latter carrying lattice fa lance fashioned their long staves with an axe at the end. As the evening fell, it began to get very cold, and the glowing twilight seemed to merge into a dark minstiness. The, glowing, the gloom of the trees and oak, beech, and pine through the entire valley, which ran deep between the spurs of the hills, as we ascended through the pass, the dark firs stood out here and there against the background of late-lying snow. Sometimes, as the road was cut through the pine woods that seemed in the darkness to be closing up, closing down upon us great masses of grayness, which 
here and there bestrew the trees, producing a peculiar, a peculiarly weird and solemn effect, which carried on the thoughts and grim fancies endangered earlier in the evening, when the falling sunset threw into strange relief the ghost-like clouds which among the Carpathians seemed to wind ceaselessly, ceaselessly through the valley. Sometimes the hills were so steep that, despite our driver's haste, the horses could only go slowly. I wished to get down and walk up to them, as we do at home, but the driver would not hear of it. No, no, he said. You must not walk. The dogs are too fierce. And, with, and then he added, with what evidently meant for a grim pleasantry, for he looked around to catch the approving smile of the rest. And you may not have enough... You may have enough matters before you go to sleep. The only stop he would make was for a moment's pause to light the lamps. As it grew darker, there seemed to be some sort of excitement amongst the passengers, and they kept speaking to him, one after the other, as though urging him to further speed. He lashed the horses merciless, unmercifully with the, his long whip, and with cries of encouragement urged them on to further excursions. Then, through the darkness, I could see a bunch of, a sort of patch of gray light ahead of us, as though there was a cleft in the hills. The excitement of the passengers grew great. The crazy coach rocked on its great leather spur springs, and swayed like a boat tossed in a stormy sea. I had to hold on. The road grew more leveled, and we appeared to be flying along. Then the mountains seemed to come nearer to us on each side, and to frown down upon us. We were entering the Borgo Pass. One by one, several of the passengers offered me gifts, which they pressed upon me with the earnestness by which they would take no denial. These were certainly an odd and varied kind, but each was given in simple good faith, with a kindly word and a blessing, and that strange mixture of fear-meaning movements which I had seen outside the hotel in Bistras, the sign of the cross and the guard against the evil eye. Then, as we flew along, the driver leaned forward, and on each side the passengers, craning over the edge of the coach, peered eagerly into the darkness. It was evident that something very exciting was either happening or expected, though I asked each passenger no one would give me the slightest explanation. This state of excitement kept on for some, for a little, for some time, and at last we saw before us the pass opening up on the eastern side. There was dark rolling clouds overhead, and in the, air, the, in the air the heavy, oppressive sense of thunder. It seemed as though the mountain range had, separate, had two separate atmospheres, and now that we had gotten to the thunderous one. I was, now looking, I was now myself looking out for the conveyance in which would take me to the Count. Each moment I expected to see the glare of lamps through the blackness, and, but all was dark. The only light was the flickering rays of our own lamps, in which the steam from our hard-driven horses rose in a white cloud. We could see now the, st the sandy road lying white before us, but there was, no, there, was, there was on it no sign of a vehicle. The passengers drew back in a sign of gladness, which seemed to mock my own disappointment. I was already thinking of what I had best do, when the driver, looking at his watch, said to the others something which I could hardly hear. It was spoken so quickly and in such a low tone. I thought it was an hour less than the time. Then turning to me, he said in German worse than my own, There is no carriage here. The Herr is not expected at all. He will now come on to Vokovina and return tomorrow or the next day. Better the next day. Whilst he was speaking, the horses began to neigh and snort and plunge wildly, so the driver had to hold them up. Then... Amongst a chorus of screams from the peasants, and the universal crossing of themselves, a kalesh with four horses drove up behind us, overtook us, and drew up beside the coach. I could see the flash of our lamps, as I could see from the flash of our lamps, as the rays fell upon them, that the horses were coal black and very splendid animals. They were driven by a tall man, with a long brown beard and a great black hat which seemed to hide his face from us. I could only see the gleam of a pair of very bright eyes which seemed red in the lamplight. As he turned to us, he said to the driver, 
You are too early tonight, my friend. The man stammered in reply. The, 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 the English heir was in a hurry. To which the stranger replied, This is why I suppose you wished him to go to Pokorvina. You cannot deceive me, my friend. I know too much, and my horses are swift. As he smoked, he smiled, and the lamplight fell hard, fell on a hard-looking mouth with very red lips and sharp-looking teeth as white as ivory. One of my companions whispered, whispered to another in the line from Burgess Lenore, Dendetch tonten, ritan schnell, for the, dre for the dead travel fast. The strange driver evidently heard the words, as he looked up with a gleaming smile. The passenger turned his face away, at the same time pointing his two fingers and crossing himself. Give me the hare's luggage, said the driver, and with exceedingly a clarity my bags were handed out and put on the caleche. Then I descended from the side of the coach, as the caleche was closely alongside, the driver helping me with a hand which caught my arm in a grip of steel. His strength must have been prodigious. Without a word, he shook the reins, the horses turned, and we swept into the darkness of the pass. As I looked back, I saw the steam of the horses of the coach by lamplight, and projected against it the figures of my late companions crossing themselves. Then the driver cracked his whip and called to his horses, and off they swept on their way to Bokovina. As they sank into the darkness, I felt a strange chill and a lonely feeling come over me. But a cloak was thrown over my shoulders, and a rug across my knees, and the driver said in excellent German, The night is chill, mein Herr, and my master the Count bade me take you all of care, take all care of you. There is a flask of Stolvisk, the plum brandy of the country, underneath the seat, if you should require it. I did not take it, but it was comfort to know that it was there all the same. I felt a little strangely and not a little frightened. I think there had, been some, had there been some alternative, I should have taken it instead of persecuting the unknown night journey. The carriage went as hard, at a hard pace straight along, then made a complete turn and went along another straight road. Seems to me we were simply going over and over the same ground again. So I took note of some salient point and found that this was so. I would like to have been I'd like to have asked the driver what it all meant, but I really feared to do so, for I thought that, placed as I was, any protest would have no effect in the case that had been an intention to, of to delay. By and by, as I was curious to know how time was passing, I struck a match, and by the flame I looked at my watch. It was within a few minutes of midnight. This gave me a sort of shock. For I suppose the general superstition about midnight was increased by my recent experiences. I waited with a sick feeling of suspense. Then a dog began to howl somewhere in a farmhouse down the road, a long, agonizing wailing as if from fear. The sound was taken up by another dog, and then another, and then another, till borne on the wind which now sighed softly through the past, a wild howling began which seemed to come from all over the country, as if as far as the imagination could grasp it through the gloom of the night. As the first howl, the horses began to strain and rear, but the driver spoke to them soothingly, and they quieted down, but shivered and sweated, as though running away, as a runaway from a sudden fright. Then in the far off distance from the mountains on each side of us began a louder and sharper howling, that of wolves, which affected both the horses and myself in the same way, for I was minded to jump from the calash and run, whilst they reared again and plunged madly, so that the driver had to use all of his great strength to keep them from bolting. In a few minutes, however, my own ears got accustomed to the sound, and the horses so far became quiet that the driver was able to descend and stand before them. He petted and soothed them, and whispered something into their ears, as I have heard of horse tamers doing, and with an extraordinary effect under his great caress they became quite manageable again, though they were still trembling. The driver again took his seat, and shaking his rein, started off at a great pace. This time, after going to the far side of the pass, he suddenly turned down a narrow roadway which ran sharply to the right. Soon we were hemmed in with trees 
in which in places arched over the, the roadway, still we passed as the, uh, through a tunnel. And again, great frowning rocks guarded us boldly on either side. Though we were in shelter, we could hear the rising wind, for it moaned and whistled through the rocks, and the branches of trees crashed together as we swept along. It grew colder and colder still, and finally powdery snow began to fall, so that soon we and all around us were covered in a white blanket. The keen wind still carried the howling of the dogs, though this grew fainter as we went on our way. The bane of the wolves sounded nearer and nearer, as though they were closing in round us from every side. I grew dreadfully afraid, and the horses shared my fear. The driver, however, was not in the least bit disturbed. He kept turning his head left to right, but I could see I could not see anything through the darkness. Suddenly, away on our left, I saw the faint flicker flickering of blue flame. The driver saw it at the same moment. He at once checked the horses and jumped to the ground, disappeared into the darkness. I did not know what to do, the less as the howling of the wolves grew closer. But while I wondered, the driver suddenly appeared again, and without a word he took his seat and we resumed our journey. I think I must have fallen asleep and kept dreaming of the incident, for it seemed to be repeatedly, repeated endlessly, and now looking back, it's like some, off, like some sort of awful nightmare. Once the flame appeared so near the road that even in the darkness around us I could watch the driver's motions, he was ra he was went rapidly to where the blue frame arose. It must have been very faint, for it did not seem to illuminate the place around it at all, and gathering a few stones, formed them into some sort of device. Once they ap there appeared a strange optical effect. When he stood between me and the flame, he did not obstruct it, for I could see the ghostly flame all the same. This startled me, but as the effect was only momentary, I took it as my eyes deceiving me, straining through the darkness. Then, for a time, there were no blue flames, and we sped onwards through the gloom, with the howling of the wolves all around us, as though they were following us in a moving circle. At last, there came a time when the driver went further afield than he had gone yet, and during his absence, the horses began to tremble worse than ever, and then to snort and scream with fright. I could not see any cause of it, for the howling of the wolves had ceased altogether. But then, just then, the moon, sailing through the black clouds, appeared behind the jagged crest of a beetling pine-clad rock, and by its light I saw around us a ring of wolves with white teeth and lolling red tongues with long, sinewy limbs and shaggy hair. They were a hundred times more terrible in the grim silence which held them even as they were howled, even for when they howled. For myself, I felt a sort of paralysis of fear. It was only when a man fe feels himself face to face with such horrors that he can understand their true import. All at once the wolves began to howl, as though as though the moonlight had some peculiar effect on them. The horses jumped about and reared and looked helplessly around with eyes that rolled in a way too painful to see. But the living ring of terror encompassed them on every side, and they had a preface to remain within it. I called to the coachman to come, for it seemed to me that our only chance was to try to break through the ring and to aid his approach. I shouted and beat the side of the Kalesh, hoping the noise would scare the wolves away from the side as to give him a chance of reaching the trap. How he came there I know not, but I heard his voice raised in a tone of imperious command, and looking towards the sound I saw him standing in the roadway. As he swept his long arms, as though brushing aside some impalpable obstacle, the wolves fell back, and back further still. Just then, a heavy cloud passed across the face of the moon so that, so that we were once again in darkness. When I could again see the driver was climbing into the Kalesh and the wolves had disappeared. This was all so strange and uncanny that a dreadful fear came upon me and I was afraid to speak or even move. The time seemed interminable as we swept our, on our way, now in an almost complete darkness, for the rolling clouds obscured the moon. We kept ascending with occasional periods of quick descent, 
but in the main always ascending. Suddenly I became conscious of the fact that the driver was in the act of pulling the horses into the courtyard of a vast ruined castle, for, the, for whose tall black windows came no ray of light, and whose broken battlements showed a jagged line against the moonlit sky.